Well, good afternoon, um, Petu Washte. It is so good to be here with um, all of you today. I have the great privilege of convening a conversation today about evaluation for tribal sexual assault programs. And my name is Ingrid Anderson. I am the National Policy Director for MUSAC, the Minnesota Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition. And I am so happy to be here with some of my colleagues. Um, I'm here with two of my coworkers, Morgan Hawes and Shayla Beaumont. And then we have two fantastic ASL um, interpreters. We have Hercules and Maria here. And so you will see them um, on the screen as we're chatting today. Um, so my role at MUSAC is um, I'm the director of national policy and I come from an extensive background of direct service provision and I'm, um, I've been excited to make this transition from direct service to policy work, um, understanding that it's the knowledge, the stories, the experiences that I'm honored to carry that um, are influencing this work. And I would invite Morgan or Shayla to introduce yourselves as well. My name is Shayla Beaumont. I'm the Elevate Uplift Coordinator. I work alongside Ingrid, Morgan, and Becky. Um, I am enrolled Chippewa Cree, but I'm also Crow, Grova, and Assiniboine. In my work background, um, I've been an advocate for domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. And yeah, I'm really blessed to be in this space here with you all. I can go next. I was just grabbing my AirPods, so sorry for the the brief off-screen moment there. Um, I'm Morgan Haas. I'm the national um, TTA for the sex trafficking program here at MUSAC. It's an honor to share this space with all of you. I'm an enrolled member of the Picun Rancheria of Chuck Chauncey Indians um, in Oakhurst, California, where I'm from, but now I am living in Massachusetts on Wampanoag land, so um, yeah, I come here with uh, experience and background in data analysis, policy, research, um, evaluation, graphic design. So I'm very excited as this is a subject near and dear to my heart. So thank you for having me, Ingrid. Well, it's just such a treat to be able to chat with you all about the work. Um, the work not only that we're doing, but the work that we're hoping to support other people to do. We know that um, sometimes we can just get really deep in the flow of our own training and technical assistance projects, and we can be pulled in a million different directions um, to attend different meetings. But really what we're hoping to do is um, to expand capacity and interest and excitement around um, the subject, around evaluation. I used to have quite a bit of fear around evaluation because I always think about like, um, you know, what is someone going to find out about me that I didn't know about, right? Or um, like, it's going to be a fault finding mission. I used to think of that instead of a, um, like a fact finding mission, right? And so I'm wondering, Morgan, can you kind of walk us through a basic understanding? So we're starting from the share, the same shared place today of what is evaluation? Yeah, thanks for thanks for sharing that and being transparent, Ingrid. I think that um, first and foremost, there is a lot of fear and anxiety, right? Just about data collection processes, um, the evaluation or assessment, um, you know, process also itself. And what are we what are we doing with that information? And part of it is really grounding ourselves in the purpose. So when people ask, you know, what is evaluation? Well there's some things that evaluation isn't, right? Evaluation isn't necessarily uh, research. It's not just focused on outcomes. And um, evaluation, I think, um, you know, one of the one of the sort of primary goals is for it to be focused around survivors and their stories, communities, um, and the lived expertise that folks are holding, um, right? And how we value um, those experiences. 
someone once shared with me this little phrase, like you measure what you treasure. And at the time I was like, so turned off by that. Right. It's like, well, I value everything equally, but then I started paying attention to like what I was actually tracking in my work and um, what excited me, like what different metrics excited me. And that kind of informed me about what I felt like was success because the success that I felt like as an advocate, um, you know, doing direct service for victims and survivors of domestic violence and sexual violence and working at a child advocacy center, um, it was, you know, very different than the other systems-based um, responders in those situations. And so I appreciate that reminder that all of our work is informed by um, the the communities, the folks that we are, are dedicated to serving. And that extends to the evaluation as well. Um, so I'm thinking about those different metrics of success. And um, I just, I feel like we sometimes ad adopt like what other people, other organizations, what mainstream programs um, are using for evaluation models. And I, I appreciate you kind of tying this in with the story as well. Um, so how, how can we, or how should we be incorporating storytelling into the work of the evaluation? Don't say hi. Um, you know, when, just like you mentioned, you know, how um, in respect to survivor services, you know, and um, just to get that measure right and exactly what are we measuring? And then taking to that account, really empowering our survivor's voice, honoring their truth, and then really highlighting the fact that healing doesn't look the same for everyone. Justice doesn't look the same for everyone. Um, maybe our healing looks different in our cult, in our different culture, or our different tribes, or our different um, how we how individually, right? And then holistically. So really um, honoring the um truth of the survivor and um sorry that's sorry I was thinking of like putting that into measure but then um really um learning from the survivors we serve and you know we still um experience a lot of victim blaming or a lot of silencing in our communities so really giving them that platform and that power of their own voice to speak their own truths Sorry, I'm also babysitting too, and then the kiddos are getting cereal. Back I to think tomorrow, Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> Shayla's excited about that. <laughs> I think you, I think you brought something up that's that's so important to highlight, and that is the co-creation of knowledge, right? And that that is so integral to our practices, right? Like our ancestral practices um, of like collectivity and really sort of emphasizing like how how we engage in this work is just as important as what, right? Like how, um, and that when we're co-creating knowledge, like we're really uplifting the voices of, of all, um, and this collective like empowerment of like the use of the data and that we are the stewards of this information of our, of our information and each of the communities, right. That everyone has, um, a role in that process of the, and the stories are really held by the communities, um, and so it's a matter of like, how do we do that in a good way? Um, and I think that really like speaks to your point, Shayla. I, I appreciate that reminder about stewardship um, because I think it's such a privilege to even be able to sit here and speak about these things so freely, right? To be able to dream and to think expansively about maybe updating our internal evaluation practices or being able to examine another evaluation tool or to have the freedom to even reject an evaluation tool that we don't feel is aligned with our communities or our ways of being, um, in, you know, a tool or, you know, a means of evaluation that, um, that resists that co-creation, that resists that stewardship model. And I don't want to lose that perspective either, that even though it is exhausting and can be kind of drudgery work, I think Morgan and I are dorky enough that we actually like this stuff though. So other people might think it's drudgery, but it, I get excited about it. Um, 
that it's still exciting because we get to think about it. We get to talk about it. It's not something that is imposed on us um, in this sphere, the way that we're talking about right now. Um, it's something that we can create and it's an expression of sovereignty. Um, I think what we are willing to evaluate in ourselves and in our programs and our communities also helps us then to tell the story of what is valuable and what we value. And of course, this leads into the ways that we're able to influence policy, um, the way that we're able to inform, say, the federal government on a, in a sovereign to sovereign relationship about what is important to us and why it is important to us. I also feel like it's very important to remember that it's new that we can even talk about these things. And there are our generations of our relatives and our ancestors who have paid, you know, um, with, you know, blood, sweat, and tears and lives, their lives, um, to, to affirm sovereignty. And for us to be able to talk about this is, is a victory that, um, that our ancestors have fought for. So I'm thinking also about how can we revisit the historical practices of evaluation and historical maybe being, you know, 100, 200 years ago, all the way up into say 20 years ago, the violence, the extractive nature of those tools um, in order to understand why and how we need to, um, to be co-creators of these tools with our own communities and with survivors. That's a good question, Ingrid. Um, and I think that you already mentioned it briefly, but you know, the disruption um, of the patterns of data use, misuse, um, even the classification, right, of our people in, within data. And, and part of this ownership and stewardship is like, where do I see myself? Where do I fit in here? What story, um, you know, sort of resonates and like is representative. And I think that some of that is based around sort of um, looking at how like sort of, I think part of looking at how data is meeting our needs and what do we need to um, sort of like, how do we come together collectively and what do we need to really like have sort of a space where folks can commune about data practices and have a voice and share in the development of that process. What what I know, what I've been taught um, it, data evaluation, it's it's in my blood. I'm second generation here. <laughs> but we're but maybe further back than that, right? Like what you're saying, that our communities have a practice of gathering knowledge. And I think that's more of what I see evaluation as now, um, as I've sort of aged and and changed um in the work myself. And what do we want those structures to be as community members, as survivors, right? Um, as the holders of that information and the way that we carry that in our community, right? And solidarity, like we define that process um, and what those outcomes might be. What are our goals and objectives? And again, like that part where it's like the shared knowledge, like who has access? Well, we disrupt those patterns that silo, that exclude, right? And determine like, okay, how do we... Um, find the folks who maybe have felt like they don't see themselves represented and include those those stories, those voices in a way that feels authentic um, and meaningful and not extractive. And we have this information in our communities. We have these tools and skills. We've always had them. And also it's so important for us to have this in our programming, to have evaluation and that collection, the gathering of the knowledge and you know how we want to measure our goals it, from the very beginning. It's not at the end of the process, right? But thinking about how do we incorporate that every time we write a grant, every time we initiate a new service, every time we, we speak to someone about their story that all of this is part of the knowledge that we're collecting and sharing together in community. And then really being authentic in community, you know, when, when applying for grants and, you know, there's so many different tribes, different histories, different policies, different 
um, ways of healing, different ways of resources, and they even the different um, beliefs in the community, and really educating that you know the different individual and unique needs of each community and that sovereignty. Really putting that historical, really putting that historical um, point in. And when we talk about sovereignty and having the freedom and having the platform to discuss as a community the needs and to effectively use that data to um, to be for us as a community. You know, Morgan, you mentioned that misuse of data and, you know, the, whether it's misclassification in the MMIW movement or um, um, our stories and our history is not written by us and not um, always factual. So really um, putting the power of data into our own communities and the our power of voice of what we need to be of what we need to strengthen our services and strengthen even come together as a community. And I don't think that we can highlight enough um, or too much, I should say, the way that evaluation has impacted the identities that we carry today and the identities of, of our ancestors, of our relatives. And, you know, I think, you know, maybe sometimes it's easier in some ways to talk about an identity that is widely recognized in mainstream society and culture. I think um, a lot of people understand or could empathize with, at the very least, hopefully sympathize with the identity of being a survivor, say a generic survivor of crime. And maybe, you know, a few could understand or empathize with the identity of being a, a survivor, a victim of, of sexual violence. But how very few of us there are who can understand that intersection of what it means to be an indigenous, a native person, and a survivor of crime, of sexual violence. Um, and it really is quite the privilege and, and an honor to carry these stories and to continue to operate at, at that intersection. Um, because we understand there's trauma even in just... Um, having a conversation about self-identification and um, the question of, you know, who are you? How did you come to be here today? Um, even maybe in a needs assessment, when someone is accessing services at your program can be awfully triggering um, or activating on different levels because you're asking questions that um, have been used against us for generations. Um, to put pen to paper and say, this is who I am, this is what I've survived, this is what I've experienced, and this is what I need help with today is so vulnerable. It was, in fact, you know, very dangerous and still can be dangerous, um, depending on, you know, what communities were accessing services in. Um, and I think we like to imagine that the movement is very inclusive, right? That the movement to end sexual violence, you know, welcomes folks of all different identities and um, whatever they've survived or experienced. But we also understand that our funding streams um, force us to be very exclusive. And speaking, you know, just from my own experience in direct service, I, I found that to be one of the most heartbreaking things is to have to tell someone you don't qualify for the services that I offer in my heart, right? I want to connect with you. I want to invite you into this space, into this conversation. I care about your safety. I care about your well-being, but because of this funding structure, you know, because of this legislation, et cetera, you do not qualify for these services. And so I think there's an opportunity to um, employ and to integrate evaluation tools. Morgan, as you were talking about from the beginning, from the first visioning of our programs to create that space, to be expansive um, and to allow that to serve, to serve our purposes. I don't think it means being dishonest or, you know, oh, we're going to only ask these questions and not these questions, um, or we're only going to track these things and not those things in order to be able to do what we want to do. Um, but to say, this is our vision, this is our goal, and we want to do it in a good way. And so here's how we're going to evaluate ourselves um, and the services that, that we can provide. 
Ingrid, you really, um, no, I, I was really, I was thinking um, when you mentioned the legislation and the policies that do try to help, but then do may harm. And, you know, um, kind of a, a misconception is that, you know, um, the enrollment issue in Indigenous, in Indigenous, Indigenous country. And, um, you know, just from speaking from providing direct services, working in urban and working on tribal lands, um, a lot of providers that we would have to outsource to would say, well, how come she can't go to the reservation? It's like, well, she's not enrolled, so she cannot utilize those services. And then really educating, but then, you know, we're working in crisis and not, I mean, sometimes you don't have that extra 10 minutes to educate on the enrollment issue or to in, even to educate on that enrollment is so different in each tribe, the different requirements requirements and um and enrollment is a federal policy right it's something that was enforced from the government and so even um sovereign and empowering our data and taking that data into our community you know especially highlighting the historical policy that went into the genocide of indigenous communities um boarding school um um laws that made practicing our ceremonies and taught speaking our language is illegal. A lot of our practices were lost. A lot of families were disrupted and misplaced. You know, the 60 scoop forced adoptions. So um, a lot of, um, of our indigenous population don't even know where their families are, where they need to search for their, where to search. And so, and then on top of that enrollment issue, so really highlighting that and bringing that into power and bringing that back into our community to educate that and that to not um, discount our other relatives, but that's what federal policy and that's what legislation has created. Sorry, I did get a little emotional there. <laughs> well, we should get emotional. We, I think it's our responsibility to feel these things um, because we carry them. You know, we carry them. These are our stories. These are our identities. And um, this is part of understanding, I think, that invasive, violent, extractive um, use of, of data collection and evaluation to separate us from ourselves, to separate us from our, um, our identities, from our relatives. And so I appreciate you centering that in this conversation as, as well. So, of course, as we're talking about the traumas, we're understanding this historical perspective. Um, Morgan, I have to ask you, why should we practice evaluation? What's the worth of it? Oh gosh, well, the one million dollar question, right? Like, why should we do this? Um, I think there's a lot of reasons why we should do it, and there's a lot of reasons why we shouldn't, which we've heard, right? Um, but one of the things that I I love these conversations because things just kind of naturally flow and pop up in our heads. And one of the things I'm hearing is about gaps, and that's one of the reasons that we should right? Because we learn what our gaps and our barriers are that are existing, that are impeding healing um, for uh, our communities, for our, for the survivors, right? And also it in, increases like our, it's an opportunity for us to really increase and enhance resiliency and strength um, to explore what are our protective factors, um, you know, and also thinking about like, how we can come together as a community um, to serve the folks who are most marginalized. So oftentimes, like with data um, and data collection, you know, we'll see certain statistics. A lot of people see evaluation, again, as being, you know, sort of combined with research, but it's not necessarily. Um, and I think that's what I like about it is the evaluation can be more of storytelling um, right. And that data collection is sort of aiding in that part of the process rather than research, which again, traditionally we're looking at, okay, well, some people get something and some people don't. And okay, we're justifying that to some degree, right? But we know that our with our practices of inclusion, that doesn't that doesn't flow well, um, you know, in in the ways that we do our work. So when we think about evaluation and assessment, I think what's sort of like really important is that, again, we go back to who are the folks that we haven't heard from? And the question is why? So, oh, look, 50% of people said that they got this service and these are the outcomes, whatever, right? That's great information to have. But what about the other people? What about the people that didn't respond to our survey, to our questionnaire, who didn't attend our forums, who didn't want to be part of the listening groups? what were the what were those reasons and how do we understand the experiences that they're having 
um, because perhaps there's something there um, that we really need to understand to better support those individuals too, so that they are feeling comfortable coming back into community, so that they do feel like their voices, um, that their voices matter and, and are valued, right? And so sometimes I think about just that evaluation is a tool of connection. And that's why, right? We can, I could sell you on if we collect data this way or that or whatever, that it's going to be great and transformative. And, and it can, it can be, but also it's a place for us to connect and for us to be together in community and for us to explore and examine how we're doing the work we're doing and who is it, who's it helping and how do we engage more folks? I really love how you said that, Morgan, like um, evaluation is connection and really learning from the, um, sorry, my little Yorkie wiener dog's getting excited if you could hear him barking and breathing. Um, no, but like connection and really um, connecting with the survivors and the communities that we serve. And, you know, um, as an advocate, sometimes it's so hard for us to um, not get stuck in our own biases, right? And to really believe the survivor and to really trust them and meet them where they're at. They know their experience it's better than anybody they experienced it and so you know sometimes um trying not to get caught up like I just want you to be safe I just want to make sure you you're in a safe place but then sometimes your idea isn't the same as their idea or your wish isn't the same as their wish so really um that connection evaluation piece really um learning what we could improve on learning what was missing or learning um you know in this movement um we can never know everything, right? It's we're always learning something. So just to keep that strong connection to um to have to learn from the communities that we serve. Sorry, I felt like I repeated that last part. No, I think Shayla, what you're talking about really is um is employing evaluation so that we can continue to learn. I am always heartbroken when I, you know, meet somebody or um, you know, engage with the service, whether it's, you know, just going to get an oil change or, you know, whatever. And you can see that they're doing things the same way that they've been doing them for a very long time. And it's easy for me to come in and say, oh, well, shouldn't you do things this way? And why wouldn't you update that? And um, we all have those blind spots, right? Because we get in our groove, we get in our way of doing things, we um, find our comfort zone, we just all do it. Even if we're, um, you know, traveling and engaging with people, we typically all have the same, um, the same ways of being. And it is, it can be very difficult to shift our identity to being a learner because you have to be humble about it, right? We have to be um, willing to learn. We have to be willing to be challenged. We have to be willing to look at everything maybe we've built or contributed to and to say things need to change and I want things to change because I believe in a future free from sexual violence, right? Like if we're connected to that vision, if we have that shared vision, um, then, and I'm saying this to myself, right? Then we can be free from fear in the work that we're doing. We don't have to be afraid of evaluation and we don't have to be afraid of, of feedback and all of these, um, these ways of, of asking for information um, and receiving that information. But Sheila, I also heard you talk about, um, you know, trusting survivors and um, the communities we serve to be the experts. And <clears throat> I've, I'm kind of wondering if we can talk a little bit about what it means to um, amplify the voices of the people that we're serving as experts in the field and not as, you know, kind of in this colonial structure of, you know, I'm the advocate, I'm superior, I know what you need to be safe, and you are somebody who's receiving services. And so, you know, there's, there is this power differential in our relationship. So I wonder if you, um, either of you have employed any tools or had experiences that, um, have, get, have showed success in amplifying the voices of the people we're committed to serving to inform our work, um, to inform your work as an individual, and what that might mean for um, folks seeking to update or change their ways of evaluation. Yes, definitely. Um, 
Ingrid, I like how you put that, you know, really keeping in mind that power structure and um, really empowering our survivors when we're assisting um, a survivor instead of you should do this, you should do this, you need to do this, placing expectations that isn't, is nowhere near, um, or we shouldn't even be placing expectations at all, but putting those expectations of what healing looks like so really learning from them what 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 their healing looks like and then just like you meant just like you mentioned um in regards to that power that um really giving them the power of voice instead of um no you're here I'm offering your your services you're going to listen to me no backing up and asking them what their healing looks like. What would they like to do instead of assigning them therapy, assigning them to go to the court office, assigning them to go get an exam or making them feel like they're on a time limit. You know, we all, we're all, we all know of the legal statutes and statute of limitations, but maybe that's not the route they would like to take. So really, um, giving them all, giving them the time, giving them that space to express what they would like to see or what they would like their healing journey to be. Cause you know, maybe they don't want to go prosecution route. Um, really um, educating about how oppression factors into sexual assault and how that factors into um, receiving services. So we don't, um, we don't want to set them up and get them um, harmful language or when they don't need to. So really meeting them and really just, completely listening to where they would like to see their um, advocacy or which route they would like to go instead of assigning and then giving them expectations of healing. You know, um, <clears throat> sometimes folks think that just because you escaped a violent situation or that you told or that you spoke your truth that it's done or what do you mean? Why is it still bothering you? How come? But then really um, educating on that healing is a process. <clears throat> and so really giving, I'm so sorry for my dog, Coda Maximus Beaumont. Um, he, and so really giving them the power of voice and the power of their own decisions because they know their experience better than we do. And then um, as advocates, trying not to let our bias dictate the situation. Like, I just want you to be safe. I just, you know, so maybe they don't want to go through the criminal justice because it doesn't look the same for everybody. A lot of our survivors do get incriminated when reaching out for help. So really keeping in mind the different factors that do play into different situations. And and I, I appreciate that reminder too, that um, we, you, the person we're serving, um, each individual is really the expert on their own experience. And um, I have fallen in the, into this trap so many times, you know, in doing research and, you know, in, in providing, you know, briefings and white papers and things like that. You're looking for somebody with credentials, right? You're looking for a reputable source of information. You're, um, you know, looking for somebody who you can trust ostensibly to tell you the truth about um, the subject you're you're exploring and. It's exciting for me to think about how we can um, really begin to invest in and uplift um, survivors, you know, our relatives, the folks who've been doing this work for many, many years, but maybe never have had a 40 hour, you know, advocates credentialing training, that kind of thing as subject matter experts, um, because no one else can speak about um, what it means to have survived you know, a certain crime, what it means to have, you know, survived violence, to have survived in, in this specific place in the world at this specific point in time um, with these specific, um, you know, barriers or services available. <clears throat> Absolutely no one else can speak to that. And um, I think instead of maybe falling into the trap of looking for um, the most credible, I have made it an intention to look for, um, you know, someone who's willing to speak the truth about their own experience, about the systems that they've engaged with. Um, because really once somebody is willing to tell you the truth, that is like, that is such a powerful starting point. And, um, so kind of going back to that starting point, Morgan, I'm thinking about, um, your call to action to consider evaluation from day one. And so I'm wondering if you can help us understand where do we really begin with, um, with evaluation in our programs, in, in the work that we're doing? 
Yeah, absolutely. And I love everything that was already shared, right? Like just about um, sort of centering survivors' voices and that lived expertise component because we're not the experts. Like those of us who are, you know, doing the work, even though we might come with our own experiences, um, there's so many intersections and so many identities. We don't, we can't hold, we don't hold them all. Um, right. And we recognize and acknowledge that. And that's why um, we really need that collective accountability. Right. And evaluation to me is a way for us to hold ourselves responsible to our communities because we're transparently conveying and exploring what it, it what it means to provide um, services and to do the work and what impact are we having. Um, and is that is, are those the things that matter and val and that the community values? Um, is that the way? Is this the story? Are we representing this and are, are we doing the work in the way that feels, um, you know, genuine and um, meaningful to the community? And so I think, you know, for me, part of what I um, like the data collection sort of data gathering process, it's, you know, thinking about like our knowledge sharing capacity and um, the tools that and strategies that we engage to share space and um, talk about really just talk about the things that are happening like that that's all part of the process of evaluation we're practicing evaluation when we're discussing what works and what doesn't work right I know my mom loves to talk about gardening, so she always uses that example or cooking. And it's it's true, right? There's all these tools that we have that at our disposal, and we maybe some of them we don't think about on a daily basis, but they all help us to create something, whether that's a meal, whether that's a, a you know, a plant or something, grow a plant. I don't know. I'm terrible at gardening, so I can't even talk on this, but like, everything just dies. I don't know what's happening. I have fake plants. I'm admitting it. You heard it here first, but it is, it's like, well, and maybe, okay. So maybe we're creating a meal and I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't have a spatula, but that's a tool that Ingrid has. And that's why it's so important for us to all bring the different skills and tools that we have to this process. And so I think the acknowledgement that we each have a role to play and something to contribute is where we start. Um, and again, right, like thinking about what do we want what do people want this to look like? Like what do these conversations mean? Um, and being really community-based um, and participatory and also what does that mean right participatory um, to me it means how do we create entry points for folks to engage in the evaluation and data collection right and the defining and all of this process because we should the whole framework should be really created and structured um, per the community, the individual community, as you were talking about, Shayla, right? The individual person, the individual community too. Um, so it that's part of it, right? Is like, that's the huge part of it is that we have this responsibility to engage, but also like, no, like trying to assess if our these activities and the things that we do have impact, it comes down to how it's being defined, right? And that's per each community, um, per the experiences and expertise that exists there. And then, you know, we, we move through that process with the community at each step. And we're, we're there, we're teaching and they're teaching and we're learning and they're learning. Everyone is together in this. I love thinking about various entry points, right? Like there's, thank goodness for the QR code. Where were we before? <laughs> That's, we could just pull up a survey or offer feedback or, you know what I mean? Um, but I'm also thinking about, I mean, entry points, even for our services. I, um, I worked for a program and all of our doors were always locked. It was appointment only. Um, and you know, there would be parents or caregivers who desperately wanted to access our services on behalf of their children. And it was kind of like, nope, unless, you know, you come with law enforcement or unless we get a call from a prosecutor, um, our doors are not open to you. But then we're out in community. We're at all of, you know, the national night out and back to school events and all that type of thing, talking about the work. And I've always wondered, like, what does it really signify to our community to have a closed door and obviously our locked door for safety reasons. I love a locked door, right? I, I am one of those people who loves to check them not too many times a day, just enough. 
Um, but also what does it mean to create not only like the entry points to engage with um, evaluation and data collection, but entry points even to our programs. And then how can we reflect that in the data that, that we are collecting? So I'm thinking about starting that process. You know, folks who maybe have been in community for a long time, maybe working for a well-established program, um, you know, maybe they have a, a healthy board that's engaged in their day-to-day -day work. And um, I'm, I'm wondering about, you know, what are some mental models or what are some kind of ways of thinking about the daily work that can support um, more robust evaluation as the individual, as the program, as the community? I, um, sorry, I also wanted to, I know it's, well, just from the last point too, but, um, you know, when we talked about individual, but then we talked about community and then about closed doors, but, um, <clears throat> and, but really being inclusive to everyone, you know, and some, you know, sometimes maybe, um, the community might not agree just due to cultural belief or due to whatever reason, maybe that's just something they don't believe in. So really being inclusive and supporting and meeting everyone where they're at, but supporting the community as a whole and making sure we're being, inc being inclusive. Um, Cause you know, culture could factor in and decide many things could um, prevent or strengthen many things. So also keeping that in mind in our, sorry, I wanted to say that a few minutes ago when I, <laughs> I think that's important. I think that's really important, um, actually, Shayla, and I appreciate you bringing that forward, right? Um, because you're right, we can't assume that everyone is at the same place with um, wanting or having a desire to engage in data collection, data gathering, evaluation, or, or any of it, right? And we have to always, like we say everywhere, right, um, meet folks where they're at, so sometimes that capacity building component of what is this is where we start. Um, how does it benefit me? Where do I see myself in it? Um, and, and then folks make a decision for themselves. That's why it's so important and impactful to like allow the community to really guide this process, but also the pace. Um, of what we're doing here, right? Because we can come up with all these ideas and strategies that we want to employ, but at the end of the day, it's up to the community whether these um, whether these ideas have uh, meaning and how they would like to see them um, implemented or or delivered or incorporated in um, in a way that feels right. Uh, for the community members as a whole. And, and it's really that focus and emphasis on the community's well-being and then the sustainability of these efforts and what they'll mean for future generations. Yes, isn't it always just kind of uh, sad to see outdated materials, um, you know, that are still being used and, and handed out at at these programs, right? Like we understand that data is difficult to gather and it can be um, challenging for a variety of reasons to, you know, practice evaluation, but also um, we are doing, I think ourselves and our communities a, a great disservice when we resist the process um, because we know if we're, um, if we have a clear shared vision of, of what the goal is, why we're collecting this data, what our plan is for it, um, that it won't just sit on a shelf or it won't be used in a way to exclude certain folks, um, that really all it can do is, is help us grow, help us refine our, maybe our service provision model, maybe what we're actually, um, not even just how we're doing it, but what we're doing. Um, and so I'm thinking also about the, you know, a couple different ways that we can start to collect that data. Um, one thing I've encouraged folks to do in the past is just to start by um, by writing your own story. And I think when we write out what um, you know what we're doing, we start to learn about what is important to us. So I'm thinking about you know the way that we can hear folks' stories. Sometimes it's just in a casual conversation. I'm one of those people that 
like I'll be stuck at the grocery store for two hours because like I always blame it on the other person telling me a long story, but like I'm standing there too. So I'm obviously part of it. Um, sorry for all the people who have to scooch your cart around me at the grocery store, but um, but I'm thinking also about, you know, things like surveys, um, entry exit surveys, again, the QR code, right? Also thinking about focus groups, you know, larger um, modalities like listening sessions um, and also just interviews. And um, Morgan, are there, is there a way to, um, to gather that data? I think sometimes we think, okay, I, I did it, right? But now what do I do with it? You know, is, are there tools such as like coding or recording or identifying common themes that can really help us to create value from these different evaluation techniques? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's part of a, a much larger discussion too about how we, um, well, I guess sort of, you know, how we analyze the information. Um, and again, that has its own meaning and definition, right? Like, so how does the community, what does the community want to do with the information we collected? Um, maybe they want to just have it for a little while and think about that, right? Um, maybe they had a, a, a sort of an idea upfront about it at the beginning of the process. Like we wanna make sure that we share this information in a specific way. So whether that's in a community forum, um, maybe that's sharing with tribal council in a report, maybe so an executive summary of some sort, maybe that's an infograph. I do a lot of infographs. People love the, the infographs. And I love making the little people and shading them with the percentage that is associated with whatever the data point is. If you guys need that, I'm your person. Um, but, you know, there's all these different ways. And another thing I was thinking about too, um, with what you were, or, you know, suggesting as sort of strategies for, um, you know, collecting uh, the data is visual storytelling has been something that um, in my work we've really sort of focused on a lot lately because there are so many ways that people tell their stories and art or journaling or any of these different like, you know, sort of modalities can be really helpful, especially for folks that they just can't repeat the story one more time, um, right? They just cannot breathe it into life again through these words. They need something else. And what are we able to offer as a connection for folks? Like what can connect people um, to this process without making them feel exhausted and extracted? And sometimes it's not the words, it's something else. So being able to really think um, and being sensitive to those various needs that folks have um, that are sharing their stories. And um, maybe that's empowering folks to use a different um, sort of, you know, method uh, to convey the information. And so I think that once we have that information, you know, it's really, again, up to the community how we use it, but that we can use those tools um, and um, that they will allow us to sort of, you know, I guess, contextualize, right? Like the services, service provision, barriers and all of that. But then we can uh, reassess later. Like, so you can always modify those tools. I think that's what I like about things like surveys and focus groups and interviews. Like it's also, to me, it's a living history where we are. And then we reimagine where we dream big. Where do we want to go? So, you know, in the whole scheme of things, it's just one point in time. It's a snapshot and it allows us to have that snapshot so that we can think, okay, what do we want for the seven generations to come? And I appreciate that kind of um, long-term perspective, like understanding where we are today is essential to um, assigning value and meaning to the evaluation of our programs, the evaluation of our work, um, maybe the evaluation of the movement at large, right? I love to see what other people in different areas can tell me about the trajectory of the movement and the trajectory of the work. And um, I love to use that then, you know, in my conversations, um, you know, discussing policy and of course with our funders and, um, you know, different layers and levels of government. 
to be able to speak to, you know, what is happening today. And this is where we're intending to go. And so, you know, here's some adjustments that we need to make. And we're going to continue to evaluate. We're going to continue to be open to evaluation so that we can um, meet this goal, so that we can continue this trajectory. Um, and that, to me, is also um, a challenge, right, to be open to feedback, to be open to um, not just leaving a conversation and thinking, oh, that was such a nice chat, but to also be hearing what the feedback is right? Like, okay, so, you know, that's where this person thinks we're headed or, huh, you know, that group of elders that I just met with, um, are hoping that we'll continue this work and, you know, we'll invest less in this, you know, that type of thing. Like that's all data, um, to me. And those are all maybe very informal ways of receiving evaluation or, um, or giving evaluation. But I think that that, those feedback points are, are very important. And Morgan, thank you. Also, I feel like um, that's a very good, a very beautiful point to kind of wrap up our conversation on, just like to, to sit with this a little bit to consider um, not only the expression of sovereignty through evaluation, but um, also sovereignty over the data. And, you know, we, um, we are all, I'm sure, hoping to free ourselves from the sense of ownership, like this is mine. Um, but I do love to think about um, data and evaluation tools that serve us so that we collectively can access this information. And um, so we collectively can, um, can be working, you know, towards a more, more deep expression of our sovereignty through these, through these tools. Um, and as you mentioned, to consider the legacy, to consider long-term, where are we hoping to head? What are we hoping to leave to our children, to the next generations? It's a little bit heavy for a Monday afternoon to consider that, but I also don't think that we can talk about it too often, right? I think it gets lost sometimes in the work or just, okay, you know, I got all these, you know, survey monkey results we're going to go through and look at all of them, but um, it can, it lends a greater, I think, deeper sense of urgency and importance when we consider what is this, um, what is this serving and where do we hope to go from here? And maybe as we wrap up, I'll ask the two of you, where do we hope to go from here? Do you have any, any parting words? Um, I really, um, Ingrid and Morgan, I really love how you both said, like really preparing for our future generations. And I, from one thing that I really hope is really bringing back that um, power of voice, really honoring power of sovereignty and um, really strengthening tribal nations to um, have put their own data in their own words and to use data to their own um for um, their community needs, but then to give them the power of voice for their histories, and then also to give them the power of healing too for their own community. And, um, you know, we've talked about um, the policies that went into disrupting our families and culture and um, really with power of data, really having the power of healing our own communities in the way we would like to see too. So that's just kind of one thing I think too really big thing that was amazing Shayla I mean I'm just like a, a documentarian I see myself as now so <laughs> I'm just here for supporting and um, like you said Ingrid like active listening and engagement right um, and I think constantly to myself like every day is the blessing and we never are assured of the next and just the connection um, that we have with folks and even just listening right to someone's story sometimes survivors come to us and they just need us to listen um and that's that's where we go next we just listen and then it will all sort of fall together thank you all so much for being with us here today thank you maria thank you hercules for being with us um as always attendees folks who are listening to this we welcome you um, to join us at the National Tribal Sexual Assault Resource Center. Um, we are housed at musac.org, M-I-W-S-A-C.org. And please reach out, please contact us if you would like to discuss this further. Um, if you have a need for this discussion in your community with your organization, um, if there are any other needs that we could offer training and or technical assistance with. 
Thank you all so much. Get to tell me and thank you.